Right, well, look, uh, it's quarter past, um, so let's get underway. Uh, my name's David Hay. Uh, now, I'm expecting the bands to come in, uh, but they seem to be late, so we'll, we'll get on with this. So thanks for coming along. This is a, a session, uh, it's fire for clinicians. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is to give you what the, the, the basics of fire, if you like. Um, in fact, I have here the outcome. So this is what I would like for you guys to be able to take away from this talk. Um, so the first is an understanding of why fire came about in the first place, or why it came to be. Uh, I'm going to touch fairly briefly on the benefits and the usages of fire. Again, it's a, it's a fairly deep topic, as, as we'll see, but some of the reasons why you might want to use it. Uh, I'll touch on the basics of it. Uh, again, it's, fire is pretty deep these days, so it's going to, of necessity, be a fairly high-level talk. But again, um, enough, and, and I guess the purpose of this is so that you can go away and you can become involved in projects that are using fire in a sort of knowledgeable kind of way, so that when, when the geeks start talking geeky stuff, you at least know what they actually mean. Um, understanding profiling. There are a number of talks on profiling here over the course of the next two or, th two or three days. They are worth going to, because profiling is really about how you make fire work for you. Uh, and I'm also going to touch on some tooling that we've been developing to help understand our fireworks, which is ClinFire and ConMan. Uh, incidentally, this talk should hopefully only be about sort of um, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, so I've left plenty of time for questions at the end. If you want to ask a question as we go through, please sing out. If we can answer it at the time, we certainly will. Uh, if not, well, then we'll defer it um, to the end. So this is a history of fire. It started around about six years ago, six, seven years ago. And it came about because the uh, HL7, which is the uh, standards organization that developed fire, amongst many other standards, had, had this thing they called the fresh look. And what this was all about was saying, well, you know, healthcare is changing. We're seeing a lot of, a lot of new things happening. We're seeing mobile devices. We're seeing uh, uh, a lot of... Um, different sources of data, patient source data. Do the standards that we have at the moment, are they fit for purpose? Are they going to take us through to the, the sort of the, the next generation, as it were? And so they formed this project called the Fresh Look Project, and a guy, very, very smart guy called Graham Grieve, uh, headed up that. Now, uh, you may or may not know, I'm, I'm from New Zealand, and New Zealand is just over the road from Australia. Um, Graham is Australian, but he spent a number of years in New Zealand. And this is really why he's so smart, you know? <laughs> so um, if you see him, you can just let him know that we understand, we know his secret. Um, but what Graham did was at once really, really simple, and on the other hand, really, really profound. And he said, well, actually, sharing information is not unique to healthcare. We're not the only guys that do this. How do other people do it? And he, he looked out and looked around what people were doing, and he came across... Uh, it was actually a, a, an organisation called, I think it was 37 Signals, but they were using RESTful interfaces. We'll touch on that in just, a little bit, in just a little bit. But he basically said, well, why don't we apply these kind of principles to healthcare exchange? And FIRE kind of grew up out of that. And it was very much a case of being in the right place at the right time, because we've been working on FIRE for a couple of years, uh, I wasn't involved at the very beginning, I, but I was involved in about the, the first meeting. This, actually, the first time they showed fire at the HL7 meeting, it was in a room like this, and it was just absolutely full. And there were people out in the corridors all looking at this exciting new thing. So that's kind of when I got involved. But around about that time in the US, there was this thing called the Jason Report. Uh, and the Jason Report said, look, you know, one of the problems that we have with healthcare exchange is we have no you know, real-time API. We have no real-time way of shifting data around. Um, fire happened to be you know, starting to become prominent at that time, so as I say, right place, right time. And if you've heard of the Argonaut project, uh, which is a project in the US to, uh, well this is the US, sorry, I, I talk in different places, so um, please uh, excuse me if I come across that. Um, but of course the Argonaut project uh, was to share data out of EHR systems, Jason, the Argonauts, this is geek humour, um, get used to it. Uh, I, I went on a um, I went to a, on a talk yesterday, uh, sorry, on a tour yesterday to your, your underground in Seattle, which was really kind of cool. And the presenter was, was saying the odd joke and people weren't getting it. And she's saying, look, if you, do, if you don't understand this joke, you've got to lower your expectations. So keep your expectation right down there. Um, but since then, what we've seen is almost universal take up by, uh, by vendors. So pretty much any vendor in the world is now doing something in fire. 
a massive interest in the providers of healthcare, doctors, nurses, allied health, um, uh, implementations and projects worldwide. The only, only place I know of that there isn't a fire project is Antarctica at the moment, and we have hopes that we'll do something there. That second point, well, second to last point, rather, the large, very active international community. I, I, I'm going to come back to this again because this is probably one of the most important parts. What FIRE has done is brought everybody together to work on, on healthcare exchange. The other big thing that's happened is that the scope has increased from just interoperability. So that's the kind of history, that's how we got to where we are today. Um, and are, are any of you Trekkies out there? Do we understand the Borg, you know, the alien race isolating people? Um, I, I was giving a talk in Canada a, a year ago and I, I came across this slide which I thought was really good. Um, resistance would be impolite. But what's actually happening, and slightly more seriously behind this, is that uh, you know, fire is becoming ubiquitous. If somebody wants to do something in healthcare exchange, they come to the community and we kind of work through it. Uh, and and the, the standard itself uh, is improved thereby uh, and, and we, meet, we meet further requirements. So I think that's a kind of nice... Um, Kind of nice slide, and it is, it is polite. We are, as Abart said this morning, it's a, it's, it's, a re, it's a friendly community, right? There are no dumb questions. There, there are dumb answers. I'm quite quite good at those, um, but feel free to talk to anybody about any questions that you might have. So benefits. Uh, these are the sorts of reasons why you might want to um, might want to use Fire, or the benefits you're going to get out of it. So as a clinician. Uh, you're able to get more involved in system design. So if you're developing an application involving healthcare of some sort in your institution, uh, it's really important to have the clinical folk on board. Fire lowers the, the barrier to understanding and it makes it easier to get involved. And as a, a side effect of this more, uh, this more improved exchange of data, you know, a, a clinician will have access to a, a wider range of higher quality information, again, which is useful in the delivery of care. From the perspective of the consumer or the patient, uh, we don't, we don't, at least in New Zealand anyway, we don't kind of like to use the word patient much these days because patient implies illness. And in many ways, what we're trying to do is trying to keep people well uh, or help people to keep them well. So what's in it for them with fire? And I think really the, the main benefit of fire is the ability of somebody who isn't an expert to get involved in healthcare. It, it, it's very similar, in fact, to, to the benefits for a clinician. But the whole point is lowering that bar of understanding what's possible, what could you do with this stuff, what's feasible, um, and they're helping to, helping to develop product. From the ability of a healthcare organisation or a, a, a hospital or something like that, there's the ability to innovate. So at the moment, a lot of the clinical data is held in sort of um, EMRs, EHRs, laboratory systems, lab systems. It's very difficult to get data out of there. What we're starting to see is we're starting to see interfaces into those systems so that data can be pulled out and used for other purposes. At the moment, substantially read-only, uh, read but we're moving to read-write. So a healthcare organisation is going to be able to develop custom apps that meet their needs but against their existing data sources. And finally, from a vendor's perspective, FHIR is a, is a familiar development environment. It uses things that, that people are... Um, are already using, that are familiar with, so it's a lot easier to get up and become productive. <coughs> and the, the other thing for a vendor is this concept of the app marketplace, the idea that you can actually write an application and then deploy it against a number of different, uh, different servers, different back-end systems. So it's a, it's, like, it's a marketplace. It's like you know, the, the, the app store, maybe not quite as big as the app store yet, but there actually there are, there are apps in the app store. Um, and so those are the sort of reasons or the benefits of FHIR. All right, starting to get into, into it a little bit more, uh, some of the details. So first off, we almost never tell you what FHIR stands for. It actually does stand for something, and it's Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. So it's fast because it's fast to develop, to deploy, and hopefully to understand. Healthcare because that's really all we do. Healthcare encompasses veterinary science, by the way. It's a fairly broad definition. Interestingly enough, apparently there have been overtures to Graham from organisations outside of healthcare who have looked at fire and said, well, can we use this? Uh, I'm not sure how far that will go, but we are certainly at the moment very focused on the healthcare space. Interoperability, because that's where this started from. This was the ability to share data. Uh, and resources, because resources are, are a key part of FHIR. And I'm going to go into, into that in a bit more detail later on. 
So it's an HL7 interoperability standard that we've talked about before. And I like to think that the core of fire, you know, if you're in, a, in, a, in an elevator, the so-called elevator speech, and say, what's this fire thing about? There's really two, two main things. It's actually, there's three, but I'm only going to talk about two at the moment. The first is the content model. So those are the, that's the information that we're moving around, the, the blocks of information. The second thing is the, is the um, exchange specification, how to move it around. So part one is how do we represent stuff that we want to move around. Part two is how do we package it up to do so. So that was really where it all started. But as I've said, it's like the Borg, uh, we've gotten bigger since then. And as you can see, it's extending into quite a number of other different areas. Uh, into clinical knowledge. So that's both the expression of clinical knowledge and the application of that clinical knowledge. And again, there are talks uh, over this, the next couple of days that you can go to to get more on that. Decision support, quality measures. We're also seeing that fire is being used as a persistence mechanism. So again, we started from the position that we wanted to be able to share data and we didn't care how you stored it. And, and that's substantially the case. You do not need to store fire resources to export fire resources. But a lot of people are doing that. Uh, so again, that's where we're seeing that moving into. But I, I do emphasize that's not a requirement. And finally, and this really is the third big point, this is supported by a large community. Uh, I, I really can't, can't emphasize how important that community is. You can ask a question and get an answer, often within minutes, uh, to, to a question that you've got. So I would urge you, it's chat, I should have put the link, chat.fire.org is the link. I, I would urge you to become involved in that. So over on the uh, left-hand side there, we have a picture of the spec. Uh, there's the link to the spec. Uh, and that calls out the major parts of the specification. So as you can see, it's divided up into um, uh, a number of levels, level one through uh, level five, uh, starting from the foundational stuff and then moving down through um, uh, through the implementation, through the uh, basic resource administration, and so forth. It's all hyperlinked uh, and easily available online. And this is, this is something that you sort of kind of, these days, we kind of expect to see. But actually, FIRE was the first healthcare standard that I'm aware of that did that. We can go onto an open site and just you know, navigate down and, and find things. And at the very top there, you'll see where it says sort of first time here, uh, there are a number of links to sort of summary overviews at, at, at different levels of detail if you want to um, you know, uh, understand um, you know, from a developer's perspective, from a clinician's perspective, and so on and so forth. Here are the sort of things where you might use FHIR. Uh, so that first one is the direct exchange of, of data, so you know, an admission notification or a discharge summary. Uh, Real-time access to data. This is probably one of the most sort of well-worked up uh, use cases. It's really where Fire kind of started, you know, talking to mobile devices uh, and um, uh, you know, updating data in real time. So that mobile thing is a, is a classic use case for Fire. Uh, referrals. Uh, and, and we're covering, covering off the directory type infrastructure. A colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, Brian Postlethwaite, is talking about that. Uh, unfortunately, it's at the same time as, as this one. So, uh, but that's one you might want to go and have a, a look at uh, when, the, um, when the recordings come out. Storage of clinical data. As I've said, we're seeing that people are actually using the resources as a way, we're persisting them into a database and using them as a way of storing data. And you can actually get free fire servers, fully functional fire servers that you can download for free, uh, use them yourself in development. Uh, you can, um, most of them like Happy or um, Vonk, uh, will have um, you know, supported systems that you can use. So it's quite possible, and a lot of people are developing apps purely fire-based, then deploying them against a fire server. Uh, in fact, the tooling which I'm going to be showing you in the, in the um, next session uh, does that. It stores all of its data against a, against a, a bog standard fire server. Um, the other common pattern, and again, that's this one here, is, is as an interface to an existing data store. And that's the way that most EHRs currently work, like an Epic or a Cerner. They already have a, a way of storing their data. So what they will do is they will just have a, 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 um, a, an API layer in the middle which lets them convert backwards and forwards. And then clinical decision support, again, is another, uh, another common use uh, that we're seeing for, um, uh, for FHIR. 
De that's both definition and exchange. And there's this thing called CDS hooks, which I'll touch on right at the very end, uh, which again is another exciting development. Okay, fire the important bits. So these are the bits I'm, 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 going, go I'm going to go through in a little bit of detail. Uh, I'm going to talk about resources, and I'm going to talk about data types of resources. References between resources, the building up of a graph of data, that's really important. Terminology, or getting coded data, profiling and exchange. I'm going to go through each of these in turn. So first up is resources, what are they? So a resource is the content model. A resource is the thing that you shift around, the thing that you exchange. And it's not something which we came up with in the, in the FIRE community, de novo. It's been informed by a lot of work in and outside of HL7. And you've got to remember that HL7's been going since 1987. Uh, I think I've got that right. Ed here in the, in the front here, by the way, is the man who started HL7. Um, so it's, what's happened with FIRE is the distillation of a lot of the knowledge that's already gone before. And what's actually quite interesting when you think about it is that the very first version that came out was actually version could, could two. Could you close the door or be quiet back there, please? Oh, Hello? sorry, could you close the door? Could you close the door? Thank you. Um, so again, this is, uh, the door hasn't actually closed, but uh, would somebody mind? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so the first version that actually was published was, was version two. And version two was built by uh, a number of people who had a need to exchange data and they sat down and they did it. Uh, and oddly enough, that's the way FIRE sort of works. FIRE works from the bottom up as well. We recognize use cases and needs to share and we build them from there. So FIRE and V2 have got a lot in common. The resources themselves are deliberately minimal. If you're going to have a look at a resource, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to say, it doesn't have hmm or it doesn't have that. If you look at patient, there's no ethnicity on it. Um, there's no religion on it. There's a whole lot of stuff. That is deliberate. There's a very deliberate policy. We, we Originally, we called it the rule of, of 80%. Uh, in other words, the idea there was that something already had to, someone's already sharing this data before it goes into a resource. What we didn't want to do is have a whole lot of modelers sit down and say, wow, this is everything we need for a patient, and you wind up with something which is huge. So we very, very deliberately didn't do that. There's about 20 or so properties on most of the resources. And the purpose of profiling is to then take that minimal thing and make it meet your need. That's really why profiling is probably one of the more important things to at least understand the principles of. Here are some examples uh, of, uh, of resources. Um, we have a patient, which represents a patient. I guess one of the things when, when you look at a list like this, there's a, a link over there which will take you into the full list and the specification, is, is there's two things. One is that each one's got a name and the name is descriptive. So again, this is just making it easier for people to understand. So somebody coming from outside of healthcare who doesn't understand healthcare and say wants to exchange um, patient data in, in version two, it's a PID segment. Well, I mean, okay, when you know that, you know that, but, but, but otherwise you don't. In fire, it's called a patient. Uh, a practitioner is a, someone who delivers care. A condition is something that you've got wrong with you. So looking at a list like this, it tells you what it actually does. And the converse kind of holds as well. If you're looking for, if you're wanting to, to share a care plan, there's a resource called Care Plan. And you'll find that most of the, uh, most of the things you want to share have a, have a, a resource for them already. Um, or uh, if not, feel free to propose it to the community and we'll certainly look at adding it into, into the next version. Yo. On the um, allergy intolerance, why call that out separately if that's a, a condition? There is a lot of discussion around that okay. very topic. <laughs> no, that's a fair comment. Yeah, uh, well, we can talk about that later on, absolutely. I won't, I won't go into detail. What I will say, though, is that um, if it's an area of particular interest to you, all of the resources have got a committee that actually looks after that resource. All of those people are online through the, through the chat channel. So if you've got questions, again, feel free to put those questions there. In this particular case, the sort of reason is because it was sufficiently important and sufficiently different to justify making it a, a resource. Those are the kind of discussions that happen inside of the community. But it's a topic of, um, yeah, it's an interesting one, that one in particular. 
I'm just going to touch very quickly on maturity. So the way we handle sort of versioning inside of Fire, HL7 standards go through a very defined process. Uh, and it starts with a sort of draft standard for trial use, meaning we think it's going to be okay, all the way through to normative where we say, right, she's done and dusted. If we make any changes, they're going to be backwards compatible. Fire, we've done it slightly differently. Uh, we use what we call a capability, uh, a maturity model, sorry, based on um, CMM. And what you, if you go into the spec and you look up the resources, they'll have a number against them. And that number will be from zero, in fact it goes up to five and then it goes to n. That's how mature it is. We have a defined scale for saying how something has to go up that maturity level. Uh, the higher up that, that number, the less likely it is to change. But at the moment, fire is evolving, so resources can change. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Um, but the really, I think it's far more good than it is bad because it, it means that we know that when the resources, when you fix those resources, we know they're going to work. So that's what that number is that you'll see there. I just want to touch very quickly on this concept of type and instance because you'll come across this particularly if you're talking with, with tech, techies. And, and I think the analogy there is a cookie cutter. So the type is the definition of what something could be, the instance of what it is what it actually is. So if you take patient, then when you go and look in the spec, what you're seeing is the type. That's the cookie cutter. And then if you go out and you see a, 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 you get a resource from a real patient, that's the instance. It's got data filled into it. It's the cookie. So it kind of helps um, if someone's talking resources, just think to yourself, are they talking about the type, uh, the definition of it, or are they talking about an actual filled in one? So that's worth um, thinking. So this is, I, I have a habit of saying this is the most important thing. Um, and I do that quite a lot, and so it's almost impossible to tell what the most important thing actually is. But this is probably one of them. So I talked about the fact that the fundamental bit of information that we move around, the molecule, if you like, or the atom, depending on how far you want to go, is the resource itself. But a single resource in and of itself is not that useful. So just a patient or just a condition um, is, it doesn't really take you, tell you a lot. If you want to represent clinical data, what you need to do is link the resources together. Uh, and you do so using these things called references. And a reference, and this is the example I've got up here, so each of these is a, is a resource, and in the middle is a procedure, so it's an appendectomy. You guys in the US call it appendectomy, which is completely wrong, but I won't, I won't go there. Um, so an appendectomy. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a procedure. And then, so what we then do is we have a reference at the top there to a patient resource who is the subject of that procedure. That's the person the procedure is being done on. And then down to the bottom left there, we have the performer. It's the person who's doing it, and that is a practitioner resource. Uh, and then we have an encounter, which is where the procedure was done and so forth. So this concept of linking resources through predefined references in order to represent a use case is one of the, one of the important things about FHIR that you need to know. Dave? Are resources always nouns? I guess they probably are. They're a thing, yeah. Here is a slightly bigger example of, um, uh, of doing this linking together. So this is a, a consultation. It's a 12-year-old boy who comes in complaining of pain in the right ear, elevated temperature, uh, I, I won't go through this whole thing, you can read it for yourself, but basically it's notitis media, then they come back a couple of days later with an itchy skin rash, uh, and there's your allergy sitting in there. And what I've done in this text is I've colour-coded each of, the, each of the, the bits of it with the appropriate resource that you would use to represent that part of the clinical story. Um, so you can see that the 12-year-old uh, the boy is a patient, the consultation is going to be an encounter, Pain in the right ear is going to be an observation, and so on and so forth. So that's a, a sort of a, a hopefully clinician-friendly way of showing how you link your resources together. And then getting slightly geekier, this is how those references actually work. Now this is generated using the, the Conman tool that we're going to be um, working on in the next session. So if you're interested in building these things for yourself, uh, then please come along to that and we'll work through a worked example. But it's a great way, I think anyway, of sort of getting your head around how, how to link the bits together and also how to put data inside of them. So there you can see, 
sort of in a similar way to my uh, practitioner, I'm sorry, to my procedure one, you see the patient there in green, John Doe, there's the encounter, uh, we see the context at the top being the observation, and I, I didn't put it in here and I should have. Uh, if we look at something like observation there, you can see the observation has got a subject who is the patient. If you go and look at the observation resource, you will see a property that says asserter, the person who said it's true. So I could, although I haven't in this picture, I could say that the, uh, this patient, that there's pain in the right ear and it was John Doe was the one who said that it, who said that, that was true. Or the elevated temperature, could, who took the elevated temperature? Again, it's very explicit inside of FHIR. Uh, any questions on references or anything like that? I just I want to be clear that it's not mandatory to fill in all of those properties. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Absolutely, it is not. In fact, what you'll see... Actually, thank you, Dave. That's a segue into my next slide. Checks in the mail. Um, <laughs> so this is, the, this is an example... Uh, uh, well, so over here on the right-hand side, uh, we actually have the patient resource from the spec. And you will see... Uh, so we have the patient... Actually, I've got a thing that I can... Okay, so there's the patient resource. Notice how it starts with the name patient. That's how you can tell. Uh, here, here are all the elements in the, or properties, whatever you want to call them, in, the, uh, in this particular resource. There is your cardinality. Uh, and it's, a, it's two numbers. Uh, the first number is, is generally either naught or one. Um, one means it's required, coming back to Dave's point. Naught means it's optional. And then the second one there, if it's a star, it means there can be more than one of them. Uh, if it's a number, it means there can only be one. So here we see that uh, active, for example, uh, is naught to one, which means it's optional. We've also got a data type of Boolean, which we'll come back to in just a moment. Whereas identifier here, uh, you can have many of them and they're optional. But it's, it's unusual to have uh, required elements in, um, in the core spec. Again, profiling is where you add the requirements in. So profiling is where you say, yeah, okay, the name is optional, but look, in my use case, if you don't have a name, I'm not interested. It becomes required. Profiling does that. This, was, this slide was really talking about structured data, uh, and I want to talk about structured versus coded. So structure is where you have some kind of you know, fixed defined layout, for a place for something to go. Coded is where it links into a terminology of some sort. And of course, the value of doing this is you get a, a, a much higher quality of exchange, uh, but you also get the so-called secondary uses. So you can pull the data out that's been collected for clinical, uh, clinical use and use it for things like decision support or analytics or population health and so forth. So that's, one, that's the reason why we have structured and coded data. Um, and as I say, I was, whoops, I'm sorry, th this is an example from the spec. Uh, all of the resources look like this. Um, and you'll see that the name of the element is there and its description over there. Uh, data types. So it's, again, another important concept. When you go and look at the resource, uh, as I had just over here, you'll see that every resource has got this data type. And so what this means is that there's actually further information inside there. And if we go and look at the, um, uh, at the human name data type, you can see that the human name data type has got these other possible values, where it is to be used, text, family, given, so on and so forth. So when you look at the spec and when, uh, when you look at that data type, you can, link, you can click on it and it'll take you into this further into the specification. But you know there's got more, uh, more properties that you can add behind it. Again, incidentally, these can be profiled as well. So if there are elements there that you need that aren't in there, they can be added via profiling. Coded data. So coded information really is, 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 is the holy grail. That's really what we want to get. Because if it's coded data, then we can do things with it. Uh, and understanding how coding works inside of FHIR, uh, it's, it's reasonably straightforward. So what we have is we have a thing called the code system. That's like SNOMED or LOINC or RxNorm or something like that. Uh, and then you have this guy called the value set. Uh, and the value set's particularly important from a clinical perspective because the value set 
selects out of the code system the set of possible codes that make sense in a context. And that's what this guy here is doing over down through here. So that's, for example, saying um, you know, in an emergency department, and it's a condition, there's probably about 2,000 common things that we see. So here's the value set of 2,000 being the most common things you're going to see in the ED department. Um, or if I'm in gynecology, then there's another particular set of, of, of things and so forth. So again, the profiling, a big part of profiling, is creating this value set. And we have this concept of, of, uh, of binding the value set to the element, whether it's inside a profile or if it's inside a core data. And, and the binding is where you say, are you allowed to have anything outside of this value set? Most of the time you do. But it, the binding allows you to say, it has to come from this value set or not at all. It allows you to say, it really ought to come from this value set, but, you know, if you come across something else, like my ED department, you'd probably say it should really come from this particular value set, but if you come across a diagnosis that isn't in it, that's okay, put it in. And this slide down here, or this, this, rather, this box down here, that's the instance. That's why I went on about this type versus instance earlier on. So you'll notice that in the type, in the definition, we actually have the value set. In the instance, it points directly to the code system. That's, again, a fairly important thing to get your head around. If you do profiling, you will almost certainly be involved in deciding what this value set actually is. Clinical folk in particular are, are important as part of doing that. Um, but I did want to point out that the value set is a selector. The actual instance itself is always going to refer to the code system. This is a condition, it's going to refer to SNOMED or um, ICD or whatever the code system actually is. Yo. I think technically we're running into the coffee break. It's half an hour, so. Yeah. Oh, I thought we had, oh. Yeah, we started at nine officially. So. Oh, we started at nine. Oh, shivers. Uh, it's half an hour break, so. Okay, do you mind if I carry on for another 15? Sorry about that. I, yeah. I thought it was, yeah. yeah, okay. All right, sorry about that. Okay, sorry, Eddie, no worries. Um, okay, I'll pick up the pace. I, just, I didn't appreciate that. My apologies. Okay, so this is the uh, binding. So this is where we say that the, um, uh, the value set, which is there, which is a type codable concept, which they almost always are, and that's the element down through there. That's where you'll see it in the, in the spec. So profiling. Profiling is about adapting fire to your particular needs. I've talked about this a number of times. Uh, again, if, if you're new here, they're, they're good things to, to pick up about. And it comes back from this idea there's many different ways we use information in healthcare, but we want the same set of resources. So what profiling is about is, is, is making fire work for your particular use case in a way that's computable. When you profile a single resource, you do generally want three, well, three main things to it. So the first is you constrain something, you take, you take things out. Second is changing this binding, that's the business of the value set and such like I was telling you before, uh, and then adding new elements, which are extensions. Uh, each profile, I'll go past some of these things, but here are examples in there that you can see, US Core, Argonaut that I referred to earlier on, um, and in the UK we have uh, Care Connect. And so over here, a lovely little bit of animation. So what he might want to do is he might want to say that the identifier for in our use case is required. You've got to have one and only one. Uh, I might want to limit names to just one. So the spec says you can have more than one name. In my profile, you can only have one. I want to change the value set here. They've got marital status. I want to put a different set of, because in New Zealand we, well, you know, Actually, no, I'm not going to go there. That could go really, 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 really bad. Um, we're not going to take support a photo. We're going to take that out. Uh, and we might want to add an extension. So they're the sort of, at a high level, they're the kind of things that you do when you are profiling. And the implementation guide is what wraps all these bits up together. So if you go and look at an implementation guide, and there's a, a registry of them down uh, through there. I've called up the uh, healthcare directory on just an example. That brings all of these profiles and all of the business cases around them, all the value sets, all into one place. They can have a look at them. You can download it. So if you go into the, uh, the VHDIR spec there, for example, there is a link somewhere probably at the top there, download. You can download all of those resources and use them. I mean, that's just cool. You just haven't been able to do that before in profiling. 
Exchange, um, really the point of this slide is just to say that you can use many different paradigms of exchange. We've been talking about the real-time exchange, but we also have documents like a discharge summary, messages like a, um, you know, a lab result or something coming through. The key part is that it's the same resource for all of those, um, for all of those different types of exchange. Okay, that's a real fleeting look across fire. That's the key bits. So again, takeaways is the concept of the resource, the concept of the referencing between resource, the concept of profiling, um, the concept of um, terminology, and the, uh, and the community. They're the five, six things uh, that you should really take away. I'm just going to talk, I've just got a couple more slides now. Um, one of the things that, that, again, FIRE has done is built up this community, and so therefore we've had uh, a number of other standards have come out of that. One of them is SMART, you'll come across it, stands for that. Uh, SMART is, is really, has two main factors. The first is the ability to create small apps that can work against uh, anybody's system. SMART apps, and there's a gallery of them uh, over down through there. In fact, there's the, there's the link to it if you want to. The second aspect is uh, because it's a profile on OAuth for the, for the um, techies, um, it's become almost a standard way of identifying and authenticating um, systems into, into APIs. So that's something, again, you don't have to understand the depths of it, it gets a bit geeky, um, but that's, it's, a, it's important to understand and recognise it. This is the other one, I talked about CDS hooks before. So CDS hooks comes about um, with the desire to develop clinical decision support and to link it into the workflow in an EHR. And so that's really where the name comes from, CDS, Clinical Decision Support, CDS hooks because we define hooks inside of the EHR that will trigger uh, a CDS application. And when it does, so the example we give over here is prescribing. So you're prescribing a particular drug, it's Toprol, that triggers off behind the scenes, clinician never sees this kind of stuff, but there's a call out to a decision support service which does stuff and it can call back to the EHR to get further data if it's allowed to. Security is baked in, by the way, that's one thing I will say. Um, security is, is from the very, very beginning part of all of this sort of stuff. But it then returns cards which can then be shown to a, uh, to a user. So this is a suggestion card, that's, you know, that's a patient's copay, for example. There's a, another suggestion to try a different drug and so forth. So the huge value of that is it separates out clinical decision support from the actual invoker of that. Which means, again, we get this marketplace concept. You can imagine that people can develop highly specific CDS services which anybody can use. Um, so CDS hooks, is, um, is, it's actually just become the first main version to come out. It's really worth understanding. And this is my last slide, so I wasn't too bad. Um, this is the reality check. This is the Gartner hype cycle, which I'm sure most of you will recognize. Um, I'm not going to guess where we are on this one at the moment. But um, I, I, I'm calling this reality check. And this came about because I, I gave a talk like this a couple of years ago back at home, and I happened to be talking to one of the um, participants a week or so later, and she said that she went along to her IT guys, and the IT guys, you know, you know, they can't do it next week. It's going to take them longer than that. So health is complicated. So this is managing expectations. So uh, I was building a house at the time, and this is uh, the analogy. So this is kind of like the concept plan. There's a lot of work still to go before you can actually, um, before you can actually do your deployment, which brings us to the point of what does FIRE actually stand for? <laughs> we don't advertise that. Thank you very much. Sorry I mucked up the time. Um, and, 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 and if you're interested, in the next session we'll go through the builder for, that, um, for those graphs. <coughs> Sorry, did you have a question there? Yeah, I was wondering, um, maybe part of the reality check, if you could go a little bit uh, deeper into how does this actually help clinicians become more involved in uh, developing it? And how does it provide patients also better access to become more involved? Well, I guess the first thing is that, hopefully, um, it's not that hard to understand. Uh, I, I gave the example of version 2 before, um, and I guess you need to be kind of geeky to understand it, but the reality of it is, using that specification, you had no chance. Um, you really didn't. Data's in the OBX segment, there's PR1s, there's a PID, it's AL1, you know. I mean, <laughs> here, we, here we have patients, allergies, um, problems and such like. So there's, there's that side of things. Um, it, so it means that what you can do is you can communicate with your development team in a way that you couldn't do before. 
So, so that, I think, that's really the main way. That's why I say it gives you the ability to become involved because you know, you, you're speaking the same language. Even if your development team is going to be concerned about you know, details of bits and pieces, you can be defining the value sets. Here's the data that I want to have in here. Um, you can be saying, well, this, this, this particular thing is coded and should always be coded, or you know, that kind of stuff. It gives you the ability to get deep, more deeply involved. So I hope that kind of answers the question a bit. And as I say, the community is there. Never forget the community. Yeah. Do you feel like CDS hooks and Fire are competitive at all? No. They're meant to be supportive? Not even slightly. Okay. Not, yeah, no. CDS hooks, CDS hooks shares Fire resources. It uses Smart for the uh, authentication mechanism. Um, it very much grew out of Smart. It was enabled, enabled by Smart. Smart, actually, interesting enough, the history of Smart was that it was developed by a guy called Josh Mandel, who's around in the building today. Super, super smart guy. Um, he's working at um, Boston Children's, and he was developing something to, to do the, um, the, the, the invocable applications. And when Fire came along, I realized that the two were so closely aligned that he, he, he basically merged all of his stuff into Fire. That's that smart came about. And then CDS hooks came about because people said, well, we're in our smart world, you know, but we want to do all this cool stuff with decision support. And that's where CDS hooks are. They're actually using it for different things. So um, Project DaVinci, for example, is using it um, for, um, uh, you know, what's it when a patient's covered by insurance plan, the word escapes me for just a second. Um, but you know, if you want to refer, yeah, prior, prior, thank you, prior authors. Prior auth and coverage and that kind of stuff. So there are CDS hooks that do that. So you can actually have a, you know, say I'm going to send you off for, a, for a, an ultrasound and the box comes up saying, sorry, this won't be covered by the patient's current plan. So it's really, really exciting in terms of, you know, bringing together applications, you know, um, made together from other ones. Uh, yeah, definitely not competitive. Okay, so again, thanks for coming, and again, my apologies for mucking up the timing. Um, I trust this will remain. No, so what happens in Connectathon in Connect stays in Connectathon. Nobody must know. <laughs>